Okay. Um, and as Bonnie said, there'll be two opportunities. We'll take a break um, right after we sort of define some terms and check in with you and make sure you're understanding what's going on. Next slide. So here's the team we have today. Uh, Bonnie is our principal planner and this is her project. Uh, I am here as kind of a host and the outreach engagement person. And we have Amy Geringer from Kimley Horn and Eileen from Y2K Engineering who, have, uh, who are consultants on this project. Next. So we're excited to introduce you to this concept of adaptive streets. It's gained traction throughout the world actually over the past couple years, but we realized as we started looking back at some old photographs that we've really been starting to implement some of these strategies from years ago. So uh, what we want to do, yeah, thanks. <laughs> so this was an example of a planter and seating that was used in parking space uh, for parking day back a few years ago. All right, next slide. Project purpose. The purpose is to identify low cost strategies that enable the city to temporarily adapt the function or use of portions or all of the roadway to address changing needs by the community. There's a need for the city to be able to have um, a way of more quickly implementing some of these ideas and uh, the adaptive streets is the application that's temporary. So if in fact uh, a strategy isn't working, it's not there permanently and we can easily make it go away. So important here, rapid response to perceived needs by the community and the city staff, temporary and low cost methods and quick adaptation. Next slide. So here are some of the examples of what we've done in the past. Mostly you can see here that we've done bike parking in parking spaces along Mill Avenue. Here are two examples. A, a shaded pavilion, again, in parking spaces and even barriers that temporarily restrict use of the street so that we can provide for more pedestrian and bicyclist activities. Next. Um, this project started back in June 2020 when our commission asked us to look at opportunities for doing some temporary adaptations in the first outbreak of COVID. We saw across the nation that people were looking for ways to have more room to walk and bicycle, to be able to get outside. We knew that restaurants needed uh, temporary pickup and they also wanted to have a little more space to extend their dining. So that shift in community needs prompted us to look at what we were calling then open streets as an approach for social distancing in response to COVID. Next slide. So we looked at what the community wanted, and this is important. Um, they wanted an ability to slow down traffic so that streets were more friendly to bicyclists and pedestrians. In some cases, roadways were closed, and that was typically done in a lot of cities in the US as well as Europe. Often expanding bike lanes and signage that more clearly identifies where bicyclists can go and where cars can go. So more room to walk and bike. Next. You also wanted a safer street. So here are some examples where painted bulb outs made the crossing distance at intersections or crosswalks shorter for the pedestrian and bicyclist. Also adds a beautifying and uh, interesting design aspect to our community. We also find that there's a lot of overlap in our different projects for transportation. One is vision zero that the city is committed to. Here you can see that even by slowing speed limits, it addresses traffic issues as well as improves neighborhood um, 
um, traffic calming and just the typical cones that you often see on streets as a means of restricting some of the right of way from auto traffic. Important in all of these is we want a safer street that's adaptable and, and allows all users to safely use the street. Next slide. So we were also addressing business needs, and I'm sure you've seen some of the adaptation, adaptations that we did during COVID um, in terms of extending restaurant space. Uh, this was pretty common again in many cities and is still in use. Next slide. And then there was placemaking, which always enhances a community. We saw generally a higher demand for space that enables community gathering. Here you can see in other cities, they were even using the streets for exercise, being able to socially distance and still be active in the community. Next. So adaptive streets, what is this really? What is this guide that we're gonna prepare? This is gonna be a guide that illustrates the strategies that we're gonna be talking to you about, not only how they are applicable, but also where is it appropriate to place these. The guide, in addition to providing strategies, is also going to clearly define process. So we anticipate that you may have questions about how does this work? How do I make this happen in my neighborhood or in our business district? We're working on that. We are working closely with uh, all departments of our staff. Uh, this is something that's evolving as we're working through this project. So we don't yet have all the answers, but we're here to talk to you about it, see what will work and how we can best roll this out. It's important for us to get the process right. So that's what we're here to do today at this first public meeting. So, so far the project, uh, we've hosted two focus groups. First with city staff, bringing them on board for what we'd like to accomplish. Uh, then we had one meeting with neighborhood representatives, special events and business owners. So the comments from those meetings are online and we used those to help us understand how we might roll this out to the broader public in this meeting today. We're here where we're in analyzing and creating the strategy toolbox. We'll hear your comments. We also have an opportunity for a meeting on January 29th, which we'll describe in more detail. And then there will be another meeting when we're ready to evaluate and we'll come back to the public to show you what this guide might look like and get further input from you in comments. We hope to be complete our early summer 2022. Next slide. So what are adaptive streets? We're going to bring in our um, consultants now. Amy's going to talk to you about some of the strategies and examples that we've seen as we've done our research and how they might be appropriate for the city of Tempe. And while you're listening, we want to make clear that um, this guide is specific to Tempe. So while we're showing you a lot of examples, not all, will necessarily be a good fit for the city. That's part of our discussion today. Amy? Great, yeah, thanks Bonnie, and thanks for a lot of that context. And so, um, yeah, Bonnie did a great job of teeing us up on kind of what, where this concept came from, um, maybe what, where the city is right now, where um, in terms of adaptive streets or what they're what we uh, maybe formerly are, are working towards calling adaptive streets. Um, so in the next bit here, we're going to provide a bit more detail about what we need by this term adaptive streets um, as it is specific to Tempe. And we're going to provide a whole bunch of use cases and examples um, that that we think are adaptive streets and really the goal, as, as Bonnie said, is to understand and get, get everyone's reaction to, are these things that, that we want to include in our 10B adaptive streets guide? Um, so if we go to the next slide, please. So first, um, at the beginning, we talked a little bit about the project purpose and, and Bonnie emphasized this idea of kind of 
quicker responses, more temporary measures. Um, and so it was pretty important, and this has actually been quite a, an adventure for all of us to really try and hone down on what is that definition that we want to use for adaptive streets in Tempe. Um, and so what, where we're at right now um, is that, so adaptive streets, it's a change to the public right of way. And so our public right of way is really looking all the way it's, it's the sidewalk, it's the curb, it's parking spaces, it's the roadway and the medians. And so it's a pretty, more, it's not really just the roadway. Um, so it's changing that, that Republic right of way. Um, it's something that's imp implemented temporarily and, and relatively quickly. We know that sometimes larger permanent changes take a lot of time. And so there, this need of, you know, we need something that we can do it quickly. Um, and, and COVID, the, the initial round of COVID kind of showed, you know, we can do this, we have done this. These are the kind of rapid responses. Um, the adaptive streets is something that includes a new feature in that right of way to change how some or all of it is used. And Bonnie showed some good examples. We'll show some more about what we mean by kind of changing how that right of way is used. Um, and another thing that's really important for this in terms of, of its application in Tempe is we're looking for these to be location specific um, strategies in response to a specific need. And so this isn't something that we're looking to say any road that looks like this does this. Um, it's really going to be reacting to what, what are some of those needs that require that, that faster response. Um, or, or a temporary response. And it's really going to be based off of what we hear from residents, community members, businesses, um, potentially other city, city departments outside of just transportation of, of kind of specific locations. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. I'd say, say also, Amy, that this is not intended to replace any of our existing programs or standards. So we have a traffic calming program that's for permanent traffic calming. We have other programs that address different needs. This is specifically to be used in an adaptive temporary way. That's funny. And so that's a great tip yeah, to the next slide, um, which is what what is not an adaptive street? Because I think that's where we've spent a lot of time saying, you know, this thing is it can, would we consider that part of our guidebook and and so we, we've been able to work through that with both the community and the city. And so some things that we're not talking about in terms of adaptive streets, um, as Bonnie mentioned, some of these permanent changes. So one thing we, we do think is that this kind of activity may help make the case for a permanent change if that's something that that ends up being desired. But but anything permanent, that's not adaptive streets. Um, certainly nothing that will be put in this guidebook or actually implemented would reduce would uh, impact safety of any user of the roadway or impact accessibility. So all of that is part of, of those design considerations. Um, and Bonnie just teed up the neighborhood traffic calming guide. Nothing that, that we're going to be looking at related to adoptive streets will conflict with that or override that. Um, that's a very established and, and specific item that the city will retain. Um, and then again, it's not going to be, be replacing any existing programs. Neighborhood traffic and calming is one of them, but there's a whole bunch of other ones related to special events or food trucks or temporary um, extension of premise. All of those things are staying intact and we're, we're looking at ways that the adaptive streets can, can kind of work hand in hand with those, but certainly are not replacing them. Okay, next slide, please. And so just a plug, and we're going to do questions here in just one second, but we really want to emphasize that it's important that, that everyone, this is where we need kind of everyone's input to make sure that as we work through this, this definition, as we show a lot of examples of what could be, um, we need to know what, what's right for Tempe. What are the things that we want to have in our toolbox for Tempe? Um, and so we'll present a bunch of things here. We also have, and we'll talk at the end, um, a survey that has even more photos that says, you know, if you like this, you don't like this, where could this work? And so it's really important that we understand what goes into this guidebook so we can continue to build them out and build up that process to be able to use it. Next slide, please. 
So I think this is our question break. So this first question break and Laura will, will help me through it, but we really want, so we do have a second one. We really want to focus on questions about that definition and of, of adaptive streets. Do, do people understand, does this make sense? Um, and, and really to the project purpose. And so we'll open that. I think um, Laura will throw some questions out that we hear related specifically to, to some of these upfront, uh, some of this upfront material. Yes, and I think the, the first one, and it's an important one that we're hearing is how, how quick is quick? What is meant by a fast intervention or quick response? Yeah, so I'll, I'll take a first stab and I think between Bonnie and I will we'll tag team some of these. And so that I don't think we can give a specific answer. It's not there's not going to be depending on what it is. It's going to be different. Um, uh, it's certainly looking to make it faster than something that would be a permanent change. Um, and usually with some of those more permanent capital projects, those require that they, they needs to go into the capital improvement plan. There needs to be specific funding identified for that specific project. And so those tend to be um, longer. And so we're looking to at least make it a quicker process than that. Um, that being said, different applications are gonna take different amount of time based off of circumstance. And so I don't think there's gonna be a clear threshold of this shall take one month from when we identify it. Um, but that's something we'll, we'll also be working through as we are able to talk through the process a little bit more as we continue on. It also depends on uh, how long the implementation is designed to be in the street and where it's going to be implemented. Is it at a school street or is it uh, in, a, in a residential neighborhood? So again, as we start defining what could be the adaptation, we want to then be talking with our staff, identifying who might be working on these requests and what that process is. So then I think when we come back to you at the next public meeting, we'll have a little better definition of what temporary means and quick means, I'm sorry. Yeah. And I'm going to go a little bit out of order because I think this sort of relates more. Um, the next question, can you talk about the difference between this and a special event? Yeah, we we can do that for sure. And so special events, um, there's some very well known processes for special events. Things like if that require, uh, I guess if we're for example the the festival of the arts in, in Mill Avenue, there are processes for we that she gets closed down, how things are done, um, and so this is not changing those processes. Um, a special event is also usually something that's in a shorter time frame than we're really looking at for these adaptive streets. And so something that's gonna be there for under a week, that's probably not, the, that's not the intent of what these adaptive street strategies are. Those are gonna be more of those special events that, that need to change for, for a very specific amount of time and then mm -hmm. are, are we're gonna go back to regular, um, regular programming. So that's how I would, Bonnie, do you have anything to kind of add related to that? No, I think that's clear. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, I think another kind of maybe special event is there's already a city process for the, the neighborhood block party, right? And so that's something that Adaptive Streets is not going to be changing or really interfering with that process. And so, again, it's it's this idea of maybe some of these other non-established needs that aren't related to something very specific that's already been identified. Okay, we have a couple more questions. Um, this one, uh, how will equity be included in the citizen participation process to educate neighbors and open on opportunities for using adaptive streets in areas of historic inequity? This one probably is more directed um, in our direction since we do uh, citizen engagement. Um, well, first we have to develop these guidelines and we have put the information out in a number of our traditional places. Um, but as we develop the guidelines, it will be important for us to go to those neighborhoods that maybe haven't traditionally um, had access to this kind of information. And we'll do that maybe through direct mailing. We may have you know, a special event in their area to sort of introduce the concepts, um, but all those things are still being developed. Yeah, and I think the one thing just to focus on there is, right, that's that's part of the process 
that we are still absolutely working through. And that's something kind of once we understand what where everyone's landing with what we want to be including in this guidebook, that internal city process and that external public process are things that we should are work, working to identify. And we'll certainly come back um, to everyone here and, and the rest of the city to be able to, to talk through. This one's also sort of related. Well, maybe we can even consider it already uh, answered. It was about public participation with these applications. And yeah, you know, it just kind of will depend on some of these things. If it's um, a strategy that a neighborhood wants to use, you know, we'll have to tailor that public participation and that um, engagement opportunity with the type of application or strategy. So let's see, any more? I'm looking for raised hands. Oh, and I see one, okay. Meryl, I am unmuting you. Go ahead and ask your question. Uh, yes, uh, let's see, I, uh, I've got a few questions. Uh, one, uh, a very good uh, example of the adaptive reuse was what uh, Arizona State University did for their homecoming where they closed university for pedestrian use only, which was a great idea. But uh, also, is there a chance for any one-way designations with adaptive streets? Oh, you can unmute me and I'll listen. Thank you um, for your question. Yeah, no, thanks. And so I'll kind of, I have two, two parts. So the first, um, the idea behind the homecoming that while yes, the spirit of that is certainly adaptive streets, that actually is one of those examples of a special event. And that's something that there are processes that the city have to handle those specific things. And so those types of events, we aren't going to be engaging with quite as much as part of this process because there is such a good process in place already. However, the spirit behind this idea that we needed, that the need was we needed more place for people to walk um, or, or people to gather and people do, and so those kinds of things will we'll actually get here in some use cases in, in just a little bit um, that I think will help provide a little more context behind that, but that the spirit of that with, with that need for a right of way is exactly what we're talking about with adaptive streets. Um, and then the other, the other part of your question related to one way designation, um, I, that's a, that certainly is something we can consider. We haven't actually, so today is where we're, we're starting to really line up where we've gotten in terms of what might be those possible applications, but Feedback just like that is what we need right now to really come up with that menu of options. And so we'll we'll take that one and and kind of vet it through the process as we keep going. So thank you for that. Yeah, I would just add that something like changing traffic direction um, is a bit complicated because if you're restricting it to one way, what other street is offering you the opposite direction? So those things would have to go through our city traffic engineer. Um, but again, at this early stage, we're open to ideas about what you might feel would be beneficial in terms of adapting our streets. What kind of adaptations do you think uh, would be beneficial to your area of town? Okay, we move on. Yeah, I think we need to get moving. We've got lots of examples to show you and we can take questions again at the end. Alrighty, so um, early on in the presentation, Bonnie went over some specific needs and those were kind of at the national level. We saw a lot of photos about, you know, dur like during these times we heard that people, or I guess nationally, um, different municipalities heard they wanted People wanted safer streets. People wanted more room to walk and bike. Businesses needed more things. And so we wanted to make sure we understood from, from Tempe specific, maybe what some of those needs are. And so some of our initial focus groups, as well as just um, looking through plans and policies to, to really understand what those needs are. But rest assured, this is still the forum to be kind of telling us what those needs are. And, and part of our survey is related to those. And so we, we welcome some of that but to provide where we're at right now. Um, what are some of the needs that we have heard specific to Tempe for demands to that public right of way? And so it's really right now um, boiled down to these, these big six. And you'll see this kind of as we walk through some of the examples about which, which of these needs are, are related to some of these different strategies. And so these include vehicles, pedestrians, bicycles and scooters, transit, 
public spaces and businesses. So we go to the next slide, please. So um, I'm not going to read all of this, and, and we'll certainly post this and have this available, but here's some flavors about what we're hearing from what are those needs of these different categories. And so from a vehicle perspective, um, there, there's a need for, for efficient traffic flow. There's a need for safe intersections. Um, there, there's a need for appropriate speeds. And so those are the kinds of things we're hearing and, and trying to make sure that we have a good suite of adaptive street, some potential strategies to address some of those. Um, from pedestrians, there's a need for sidewalk improvements that we've heard. Um, we hear needs related to safety, of course. Shade and cooling is one that we'll, we'll talk a little bit about. Um, generally, this idea that we, we need accessible infrastructure for, for those and not just for, for all ages and abilities. So we can go to the next slide, please. Some of the things we're hearing related to bicycling or scooters, um, there, there's a need for some protected or separated facilities. Um, there's need for bike share and bike parking. There's need for wayfinding. Um, and again, always the undercutting here is safety. In transit, some of the things that, that we've heard that, that are needs that might be addressed by adaptive streets. Um, some more dedicated space for transit more bus stops, um, shade at bus stops. So more around some aesthetics. And so that's what we're hearing. We've heard so far for transit and then public space. We're hearing a lot of, again, around this aesthetics and public art. And we, we really wanna create a place and we wanna create places of community pride. Green space, green infrastructure is something that, that has been a need. Um, generally kind of a wayfinding or information that's something that that's kind of a demand on our right of way that we need and then from a business perspective needing some of the needs have been related to you know ex exterior services that uh, we saw a couple of good examples and we'll see some more around especially with with during this kind of covid time um this idea that it's been wonderful to be able to have businesses expand into the, the street and allow them to, to continue. So that's something that might continually be a need. Um, balancing parking. And, and so that's, that's one working through some of those competing demands on the right away. All right, so here we're gonna throw out some specific use cases that our team has come up with in terms of what might be a use case for adaptive streets. So one thing to note here is that, especially the kind of the this, this second thing, this items to consider. And so I teed up earlier on that adaptive streets is not gonna be a blanket thing that happens on all arterials or all collectors or anything. So it's very much specific to the location that the needs identified, what are the surrounding land uses? What are the other um, demands on the roadway? What, what do we have to work with in terms of the right of way to, to help make, see that an adaptive street strategy can actually be successful? And we certainly don't wanna be suggesting things that, that aren't considering the surrounding context and other competing um, demands. And another part of that is just the, the surrounding um, stakeholders who, who else might be, have, have some stake in that area. So this first use case we have here is, is this need for an enhanced pedestrian environment at intersections. So there, we have here three potential examples of how of different adaptive street strategies that could address that need. Again, how you choose which one is right for that specific location has to do with those different items to consider. And so it's gonna be a very kind of individualized process. But some example potential adaptive street strategies for this are, um, Bonnie actually pointed out this one earlier, some temporary paint and, and barriers to, to, um, for intersection improvements. And so she showed, she talked here a little bit about, you know, how this will reduce the um, amount of the, the crossing distance. And so it's kind of in improving that pedestrian experience. Um, the second one to temporary paint. So here we don't have those vertical barriers, but it's just temporary paint to increase awareness of an existing crossing. So that could be an adaptive street strategy for, for this need. Um, and another example here is movable planters or temporary vertical options. Um, 
to increase awareness of a new intersection improvement. And so maybe we've, we've made a permanent change and there's a need for temporary awareness in using some of these adaptive street strategies. So if we can go on to the next slide, please. Here is an, another suite of potential strategies for the use case of the, the need for wanting more space to bike. Um, and so some of the options for adaptive streets might be shifting vehicle parking to temporary bike parking. Um, this is an example of something Tempe's done before. This is, this is not necessarily a, a whole new thing, but it's formalizing that process of, of identifying that need and seeing if this is the type of strategy that might um, from a temporary basis, support addressing that need. Um, these two in the middle show this idea of temporary shared or open streets. So it would be putting up, like putting up some sort of, whether it's signs or barricades or planters or things that actually temporarily kind of restrict certain uses of a street. Um, and so we saw a lot of early photos around a lot of places did this during COVID because there was a need for people who wanted to be outside and they, they weren't driving anymore. We wanted more room to walk and bike. So this idea of maybe temporary or, or shared streets. And then our third example here on the right is movable barriers to create additional space for biking. And so this might be a temporary um, strategy for for the demand of wanting more space to bike. Okay, next slide, please. So this one is looking at the potential use case. Um, with, if there's a need for more space for transit or for more people who are riding transit. And so some of the different adaptive street strategies, one, maybe there's, there's an opportunity to do a temporary bus only lane. Um, and, and obviously, depending, looking at those items to consider and, and looking at other demands, looking at land uses, looking at some of the, the visions and plans that the city is looking at, um, might that be something that is part of our, our menu of options for adaptive streets? And a second option here um, is really looking at some temporary shade at transit stops. So that could be using temporary shade structures or, or something, especially maybe during summer months. Um, where it's not permanent, and so we're not permanently changing the right of way, but we are putting something there to, to address some of the needs, and that would be an adaptive sheet strategy. So next slide, please. All right, and then this is our fourth use case, and so the need here would be there's a need for more room for outdoor business use or dining or shopping, um, or a need for more public space that kind of responds to the neighborhood, and that idea of placemaking. And so some potential adaptive street strategies to address this need. Um, we see on the left here, a temporary shift of parking and vehicle lanes to support some of these outdoor business uses. Um, temporary shift in excess parking to put things like benches or greenscape. And so I think Bonnie said earlier, this is actually an example of something that that, that is a Tempe photo. Um, and so having some of this opportunity to consider uh, adjusting, and it's, it's not for parking at, for it's a temporary point, it's for green space or, or seating. Um, and then this third one here on the right uh, is this idea of, of temporary painted murals into transportation solutions and really honing in on that placemaking and kind of community culture. And is, is there a need and is there an adaptive street strategy that might support that? So I'd add here, if you could go back to that slide just for a quick minute. For instance, in the painting in the intersection, a lot of um, communities find that this really builds stability in their neighborhood. Having a, a design in the intersection pretty much prompts people to pause or go a little bit more slowly or pay attention to their surroundings. So those can all be a means of slowing traffic. And again, I think what I've seen in the research I've done is there's a real pride of place when uh, neighborhoods have this opportunity. Okay, next. Yeah, and so I think that we've gone through a lot of examples, a lot of photos. Um, so we're gonna take another pause and I, I've been seeing some questions come in just 
explore some questions about, about this concept, some of these use cases, and so we'd love to hear from folks. Yeah, so our first one is, what is an example of, a of what a neighborhood would use this for, and how would it be funded? Okay, well, so do I- Do you want to take that, Amy? Yeah, start. I'll take it, and we'll start with the, the easy, the part that I can easily answer, which is the funding, and so that's, that's a to be determined. Um, that's part of those processes we're working through. Um, right now, this we're, we're in the concept phase, and this is kind of a plan. And we will be working through some of those process, those more kind of process related decisions around funding. And so stay tuned at a later time for for some of those answers. Um, so in terms of an example of how a neighborhood might use this, I think it so a potential need that that might come out from a neighborhood is a need for, I think this last one that Bonnie was talking a little bit about is a good one, a need for maybe placemaking or, or kind of a, a, a temporary thing to bring people together for um, community identity. And so some of these different options around painting or putting in temporary aesthetics could be an adaptive street strategy to support neighborhoods. I think another one could be the temporary um, need for more more space to walk and play. Um, that could be something. And so looking at some of those different strategies that we put out there um, in, in some of the previous use cases around what might be some of those strategies to, to a temporarily a, a shift how the roadway is used to provide for more, more public spaces. I think also most all of our neighborhoods have neighborhood schools. There might be an interest in um, uh, better uh, uh, drawing more attention to the crosswalk, perhaps with paint. Uh, in some cities, they actually close a school street just during the hour when children are arriving and the hour when they're leaving. They found that this reduced accidents. It uh, actually increased biking and walking substantially. A lot of the cars were actually parents dropping and picking up kids that was creating the traffic congestion. So um, they and they had an improvement in air quality. So some of those things have been documented other places and we might um, want to consider some of those. So I think these can be utilized in some of our new innovation hubs where we've got changes in uses perhaps a mix of mixed um, mixed use areas, industrial, commercial, residential, multifamily, uh, where you've got a lot of different people utilizing the street. They may come together and look at some of these opportunities um, for adaptation. And again, on budget right now, what's important is to say, is this needed? What would it look like? What kinds of things could we do? Um, I want to be clear that uh, some have talked about Marianne Quarter grants. Those grants are specifically for permanent neighborhood improvements, but there are other types of grants that may be available to communities, and there may be uh, some city funding down the way. Uh, we won't know any of that till we really get through uh, this process and outreach. I think you were, uh, answered this person's uh, next question about uh, grants being used. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. I, I will give the example, though, that, that she states. So, for example, if there are residents parking in a no parking zone, could a neighborhood get a grant to put in a painted area that would emphasize that it is no parking? That's a little more of a temporary potential. I don't know about a grant, though, for that. Yeah, that's an interesting use case. Um, we'll have to think, I, I don't wanna do a rash um, response to that. So I, I thank you for that and we'll take it and we'll kind of work through our process and see if that, that is an applicable use case. But from the perspective of um, funding, again, more to come, we, we know that this is an important topic. It's probably generally even from, from the city side um, when we get a lot of questions from city folks. And so we're, we will work to that and come up by the end of our project with, with an answer for that. 
Would anyone like to be unmuted? I'm only seeing Meryl's hand and I'm guessing that's from earlier. Okay, here's another one. Uh, the idea around schools is fantastic. Would love to see that focus in a lot of the school areas. The parking issue is by the school that I mentioned. Thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions that we can answer? We don't have too much else. We just have a couple of different plugs for, for more opportunities to hear from you, but. I did yeah. see in the chat some additional questions here. Um, will these interventions be done in response to crash data or only citizen suggestion? Uh, the interventions can be prompted by city staff or by the citizens or businesses in the community. Typically, data driven processes are used when we're doing permanent interventions. That doesn't mean that it couldn't be available information could be used, but in this temporary process, we wouldn't be going out and hiring consultants to do specific testing. That would be more in line with neighborhood traffic calming and other programs. Yeah, I mean, and I think one thing to emphasize, if there's a safety challenge, that's not something the city's going to take on a temporary um, basis. And so there is, while adaptive streets may be something that gets engaged in that process, it certainly is something that that will be a more permanent discussion. Right. Uh, here's uh, another question. Uh, some of the places that could test these kinds of interventions are major arterial and collector streets, especially in north south streets. How will these needed interventions work under this proposal? Um, that's a really broad question to something we're trying to be very location specific on. So I think the way, the best way I can answer that right now is that we're hoping to understand what types of, of those interventions or those strategies you think might actually be applicable. What, what is the need driving that? And then we're really looking forward in this project to put together that process to identify those that, that are most compatible depending on whether, depending on the type of roadway, what's surrounding that roadway. Um, so we, I, I, I think it goes back to not wanting to kind of have a one size fits all um, answer through this process. Okay, we have another one. Uh, how will data be collected before, during, and after temporary changes to measure impact? That's an excellent question. Um, we do not have an answer for that yet. We are still working through the, the process component of it. And so I think that that's a great data point for, for our team as we work through that um, over the next about six months, five to six months. And so thank, thank you for thinking about that. Data is important um, and we will will keep that in mind as we work through that. Again, each neighborhood's different. Some of that might be neighborhood um, collection of data or observations um, as we again get further into defining what the intervention will be we'll have a better sense of how we might what we might want to measure um, and again there are cases where a temporary um, implementation can work so well and everyone's so happy with it that it could lead to discussions of becoming permanent. So uh, you can keep that in mind. Also, I'd like to mention that temporary comes in a lot of different packages. Temporary can be seasonal, as we discussed about shade. Temporary can be different times of day, only on a weekend day, only on, a, on at hours where school is um, beginning and ending. So. It, it, the this whole proposal is really broad at this stage so that you can give us feedback about what ideas you have that could be helpful in your community. Okay, and this next one you've you've kind of touched on it, maybe even answered it, but I'm in case there's more that needs to be added here. Uh, it would be useful to have a plan that would allow a transition from adaptive to permanent. 
the original intent would not be permanent. But that is, if something works so well as adaptive that people would like to see it become permanent after loving how it worked out as adaptive. Right. You know, if we can make everybody happy in a neighborhood, that's terrific. And, you know, sometimes you don't know how something will work until you give it a try. So definitely, um, if we get a lot of positive feedback and there's interest, we can look at a more permanent opportunity. Again, that would need additional vetting by our traffic engineering and other staff to be sure it's appropriate as a permanent uh, solution. Okay, anybody else? I'm not seeing any raised hands. Nothing new in the chat. Or in the Q&A. Very good. Okay, well, and thanks everyone for, for all of these questions, because these have been been really good questions um, and we're, we're excited that there's interest and, and a lot of people are already thinking about this. So we're, lo we're looking forward to hearing a lot more and, and coming back to you with hopefully some answers. Um, so if we go to the next slide then. Next step. So we have in January gone out to a variety of city commissions, uh, transportation commission being a uh, our primary outreach because they did in fact request this type of intervention. But we've also gone to the Sustainability Commission, Neighborhoods Commission, Development uh, Review, and uh, again, wherever there are people who are interested in learning more, we will go out and address their questions. Um, we're looking to assemble something of a toolbox over the next two months so that we can bring back specific recommendations and how they might be implemented. March and April for defining in more detail our street processes and then coming back to you in uh, and the commissions and council in April and May to present uh, the draft implementation design guide. Uh, so I think what we want to know is it, what we're looking to find is how might we create a toolbox where maybe some of these objects that could help in doing temporary uh, modifications might be available through the city. We'll also look at funding sources, how we might be able to assist with funding. So we need your input. We have two options after this meeting. First of all, if you can provide feedback through our survey after this meeting, that would be very helpful. But I really want to let you know about our transportation open house that's coming up on Saturday, January 29th. This is in the southeast corner of the Tempe Public Library parking lot, where we currently have a park and ride. And so that is a new use of this part of a parking lot uh, for our rapid uh, city bus service. While we're out there sh talking about adaptive streets, we're also going to be displaying three prototypes for our transit shelters. So you'll be able to sit in them, walk around, take a look, talk with our consultant group about the tran transit shelters that we'll be placing beginning in uh, late summer this year. We have um, Mobility Hubs project. Uh, Robert Yabez will be out with his team talking about mo mo mobility hubs as well as transportation demand um, and uh, some of the other programs that he is working on currently. The ADOT is going to be available to answer some questions about the Broadway curve and that widening. Braden Kay and some sustainability staff will also be available. They'll be talking about the climate action plan. And as you know, this really integrates with our transportation planning because we're always looking for ways to make cool streets, uh, make walking and cycling um, 
more more safe during the hot temperatures in the summer. I think he's also bringing out some trees that will be available for giveaway and plants, and he'll be looking for feedback on the climate action climate action plan. And also, uh, we cul de sac are is a development on Apache that's doing the first car free residential development in Tempe. And they have some interesting ideas and we'll be showcasing some of those as well. Did I miss anything on Saturday? The, the event becomes broader, more broad as we talk about it, but there will be a lot of people available for you to talk with and ask questions about all of these projects on Saturday the 29th. That's from 9 to 11 a.m. And at the same time is an event called, um, I always want to call it Comic-Con, and that's not it. It's and, um, yes. And and, so there's a lot of fun activities at the other end of the parking lot uh, if you and your families are interested in attending. Thanks, Bonnie. Nice wrap up. Anyone else before we close it out today? If not, thanks. Thanks for spending your lunch with us and hope to see you on Saturday the 29th. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.